From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start, as we always do, with a check on the markets. Joining us now is Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. So it's remarkable to me what the markets are doing, shaking off that GameStop thing, even the silver thing. They seem to be coming back, Abigail. They are certainly coming back, a very strong risk-on mood. And behind this, I think it has to do with the refocusing to some degree on the possibility of stimulus. We have the best two days for the S&P 500, up about 3% over the last two days, going back to November 5th. And and right now, we have strength for energy, we have strength for the banks as yields back up. And as the focus again goes to stimulus with the Republicans, 10 senators proposing a greater than $600 billion deal that includes many of the big uh, items that uh, President Biden's administration wants, even though it's much smaller than the $1.9 trillion, it keeps the idea of stimulus moving forward. So in theory, at some point, that would hit the economy. So markets clearly like that. The reason investors are looking past games and those other names, David, in terms of a market cap standpoint, the overall stock market is somewhere above $50 trillion. GameStop and those stops were maybe $50 billion, and what goes up must come down. Very painful day for GameStop. Painful two days, in fact, for GameStop. Down in a huge way as investors uh, revisit the speculative nature of that trade and the fact that the fundamentals uh, probably don't support the huge move that we've had for that stock, David. Last year, in September, GameStop was a $4 stock. Last week, it was a $4 $483 stock. Right now, it's right above 100. Earlier, below 100. You know, lots of mania. This is the more painful side of it. Huge, huge volatility. Yeah, as you say, maybe inevitable. What goes up must come down. Uh, but, but talk to us about what's going on with the basic stock market right now, because as you name the, the stocks, the sectors that are up, they sounded more like the we're going to get back out, not the stay at home sectors. You're right about that. It is the reflation trade, the reopening trade, and I think it has everything to do uh, not just with the stimulus, but also vaccines, as we do have more Americans uh, at this point who have been vaccinated as opposed to new cases. That's certainly encouraging. And I think that there's just this sense that we are going to beat this thing. It may take a while, it may take months, but nonetheless, there is that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. And for that reason, you have these reopening sectors, energy and uh, banks, industrial, beneath the surface airlines, some of the other travel stocks uh, climbing as investors, traders look forward to that possibility that we're going to finally have this brighter 2021. We certainly hope so. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, Congress is paying attention to GameStop just like the rest of us. The Financial Services Committee is going to have some hearings on it on February 18th, but it's also very much involved in the back and forth over further fiscal stimulus. For a view from Capitol Hill, we welcome now back Democratic Congressman Don from Virginia, Don Beyer. He's Congressman Beyer is the incoming chair of the Joint Economic Committee and a member of the House Ways and Means Committee. Always a pleasure to have you with us, Congressman. Let's start with stimulus. We had reports out of that meeting of the 10 Republican senators who went to the White House yesterday uh, to meet with the president. Uh, are you encouraged there might actually be a deal here? Oh, well, it, you know, I was really encouraged that they went and encouraged that they had such a good conversation with, with our new president. But they still seem really far apart. I mean, the president's COVID package or relief bill is $1.9 trillion. I think theirs came in at a little, little over $600 billion, so a third of it. And some of the things that we Democrats find essential, which is giving money to our local governments, um, they, the Dem Republicans really seem to resist. I think as Democrats, we're open for middle ground, um, but it's going to be middle ground well north of a trillion dollars, um, not, not something that's a third of what the president wants. Do you have any indication that at least 10 Republican senators, which is what you need to get past that filibuster, might be willing to go as far as a trillion or over a trillion dollars, as you just said? Uh, I I, I suspect not. I mean, it would be wonderful if they would. We'd rather have it be bipartisan. But in the meantime, David, you know, we're going to have pass a rule tonight on the budget reconciliation process, which will take weeks. But we're ready to do it without any Republican votes if we need to. We, we don't want to make the same mistake we made in 2009 with two small stimulus and eight to 10 years of slow growth. So, Congressman, give us a sense of the numbers, because the accounts of the meeting yesterday suggested that the president with the Republican senators was really going over the numbers. And the, the Republicans were saying, show us why you need that amount of money for that line item. Uh, you're on the Joint Economic Co Committee. As I say, you're about to take over as chair. Give us a sense of why we really need this for the economy. Yeah, well, let me break that in, in sort of three pieces. Yeah, lots of attention is being paid to state and local because half of the states actually improved their revenues in 2020. 
but the local governments didn't. Uh, I, I live in Northern Virginia, a, a fairly wealthy area, and every one of our local governments really got hammered. And which also means the schools got hammered, that the schools that need more money than ever before are really, really struggling. The second big piece is the unemployment. We're still looking at, you know, uh, 900,000, 850,000 unemployment claims per week. And the, the unemployment runs out in March, March 14th. So if we don't act pretty quickly, uh, you're going to talk about, you know, 10 million Americans who are going to be basically no money for food on the table or rent. And, and then the, the, the third big piece is just trying to get the money for the coronavirus. You know, he's got 20 billion in there for vaccine, but another 100 billion for the distribution, because we're finding that the distribution is the real challenge to get, get through this pandemic. And David, as you know, every economist across the political spectrum says we don't get an economic recovery until we get the virus under control. No, I agree with that. That's certainly every we talk to says exactly that. It talks about the $1,400 to sort of gross it up to $2,000. Uh, there is some suggestion that maybe the Democrats would be willing to have that be more targeted and exactly who's eligible for that. Because if you go up the numbers, you can get a payment of some significance when you're making a lot more than $75,000 a year. Yeah, and that is, uh, when we looked at it just from a, like a fairness perspective, that is a real concern. And I know that, I believe the Republican proposal was $1,000. Um, you, you were, we're pretty comfortable with the 1400 not only because Donald Trump had recommended it, um, but because even though there were people who don't need it, um, you know, like some of my junior staff that still have a good job, um, they'll all spend it. And so part of that is is not just uh, safety valve money, relief money, it's, it's also economic stimulus, putting money in the hands of people with high propensities to spend um, to help bring the economy back. So part of this is just how do you get money um, where it's going to hit the economy right away and get the multiplier effect? And putting in the hands of people that make, you know, they're in the bottom third of income earners is most likely to do that. So we can't have a conversation these days without talking about GameStop. I mean, it's just we can't resist the subject. And as you suggested, I mean, you're a very successful businessman. You built a very successful build business there in Northern Virginia. Give us your take on what happened here. Is this just natural in a sense for the uh, uh, for the markets? And that is to say some people bet, some people lose. Or is there something more troubling about what we're seeing? I don't – I'm not so troubled by it. I think everyone understood that GameStop is not – um, a, a growth stock. I mean, the, the, you know, everyone, all my kids buy their video games online. Um, but what it does show is the ability of the internet and free stock purchases and things like Reddit to manipulate markets. Uh, so it's not just the hedge funds that get to manipulate them. The, the, the common man uh, with this amazing communication tool can manipulate it also. Um, you know, I, it seems to me like as long as we don't interfere, that there's some pretty fair fights going on. Exactly. At the same and, time. And, and you can have big losers on both sides. You know, the 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 the, the, the day traders who were going to buy high and, and sell low and the hedge funds whose shorting didn't work out so well. At the same time, uh, sometimes we get concerned when actually people can't trade. And that's what happened with Robinhood, where they, for some period of time, had to shut down the trading, apparently because they just couldn't post enough of the reserve to the exchanges uh, to cover it. Might we need some regulation to really require some of these companies, brokerages and maybe exchanges themselves, to post some reserves, sort of similar to what we expected out of the banks after 2008? Yes, I do. And, and David, that's the worst case is – when um, you, you can't recover the money from people who, who owe it to you. And so the, the reserves is really the, the interesting thing. I don't really fault Robinhood for not realizing that this run-up was going to happen and that they didn't have the reserves. I've been thrilled by the people who've been pouring in, what, $2.4 billion in the last couple of days into Robinhood. But that's probably where the regulatory thing's going. And, and the congressional hearings are going to be fascinating because it's got – when you put uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ted Cruz on the same side, you know interesting things are happening. Yeah, that's interesting at the very least. That's right, Congressman. Finally, I don't ever want to talk with you about talking about the car business because you know that car business so well. What is your sense right now about the automotive business? And in particular, are people buying cars? Are they paying for cars? Is there some delinquency in the borrowing? Yeah, it's, it's down a little bit from last year. But for most car dealers, um, 2020 was a very good year. The people who, uh, first of all, people were, were shifting from transit to single automobiles and out of carpools. 
Uh, many people that had a job and got the check were using that as a down payment. Um, people were saving a lot of money on gas and, and they weren't buying services out of the home so they could buy cars. Uh, but we are in the middle of a fundamental trans transformation. The, the General Motors commitment to all electric by 2035, um, a lot of the others will follow pretty quickly. Uh, it's going to be a very different business model at the retail level when you don't have to change the oil every 3,000 miles. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, the aftermarket. So the service business, which I think you make a fair amount of money off. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is that right? Most of it? Yeah, yeah most of it, yeah. Okay, thanks and so much. In fact, with, with the disintermediation, the price disintermediation on the internet, you sell every car for, for cost or less. Um, um, so you are you have to make money on something else, including financing. There you go. That's why we always want to talk to you about cars. Thank you so much, the Democratic Congressman of Virginia. He is Don Beyer. Coming up, President Biden's executive orders today will address immigration. We hear from the former president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. He's David Leopold. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Biden will be signing three more executive orders today, this time changing the Trump administration's immigration policies. To take us through what to expect, we welcome back our Washington correspondent. She is Emily Wilkins. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, David. So with these immigration policies that we're going to be seeing Biden sign later today, it's a lot of asking agencies to sort of look in and review Trump's policies, particularly the Department of Homeland Security. So there might not be some concrete changes made today, but it will be things like asking the Department of Homeland Security to look into the asylum rules that Trump implemented, asking various departments to look into whether people who tried to immigrate to the country legally have been prevented from doing so and why. Uh, Biden is also going to be setting up a task force today with the goal of reuniting children and parents who were separated at the border under Trump's policies. And obviously, uh, immigration was sort of a very partisan issue under the Trump administration. It was something that you heard a lot of decrying from, from Democrats. So these are issues that Biden's sort of trying to tackle early. He's also sent a larger immigration bill to Congress, hoping to sort of do the more deep reforms in the immigration system. Obviously, right now, the priority is COVID-19 and getting Biden cabinet members sat. But that definitely shows that it is a priority that uh, President Biden would like to address within the next four years. Okay, Emily, thank you so much. Once again, President Biden will be signing those executive orders later today. To put today's immigration orders into a larger context of a Biden administration immigration policy overall, we welcome now David Leopold, partner at Ulmer and Byrne. Mr. Leopold earlier served as general counsel and then president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. That is a bar association of 15,000 lawyers and academics across the country who practice and teach immigration law. So, David, thank you so much for being with us. Put it in the larger context. These are very specific orders addressing specific issues. But what is the overall immigration policy as it's developing under President Biden? Well, look, um, and thanks for having me, David. This is a paradigm shift. We have come out of the darkest days of the last four years have just been dark and, and terrifying for a lot of families for the country. And um, this is a paradigm shift. The President, o President, o President Obama, on his first day in office, made it really clear that he was going to protect dreamers, that he was no longer going to stand for America would no longer be a country that keeps out people because of their religion. And he, li he li lifted the Africa and Muslim ban. He also showed that we're not going to spend hard-earned taxpayer dollars and we're not going to divert money that should go to our defense to build a a vanity project called the Border Wall. Uh, that was a, a project of President Trump, former President Trump's vanity. And you know, um, so what, what's happening today is a is a more elaborate showing of that paradigm shift. And if I if we think of anything at all on immigration over the last four years, what sticks in my mind, and I know in a lot of people's mind, is that horrible image of children in cages. And today, what, what the president is going to do is going to say, we're, we're going to put together a task force to reunify families, to reunify parents and children that were separated at the border. There's a lot more. But today, to me, signals signifies a major paradigm shift in the way the White House looks at immigration. It's now, we are now, again, a welcoming nation. 
So, and that's so, what America should be. So putting children together, once again, with their parents or other guardians clearly is a priority. Is it doable? Can we do it at this point? Do we have enough records to know which parents go with which guardians? Well, we're certainly going to find out. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the incoming Secretary of Homeland Security, hopefully will be confirmed later today, Alejandro Mayorkas, um, will have his hands full going into the department because the Trump administration, through its malfeasance, through its neglect, through its intentional misuse of power, um, has left a mess of the government, and in particular the Department of Homeland Security. You know, when they separated those children, when the Trump administration separated those children from their parents at the border, and separation is a kind word, uh, the, the word that I think more appropriately describes what happened in kidnapped. And when they did that, they didn't have any plan to reunite them. Um, and so it is going to be a, a, a very difficult uh, uh, thing to do. But I think this administration, the Biden administration, is absolutely committed to making sure that each child who is separated from their mom and dad finds their mom and dad. And that means looking in the home countries. That means looking throughout the United States. And hopefully, hopefully America can at least rectify that horror that was done to those families. Uh, David, I think that one of the most powerful laws in Washington, D.C. is the law of unintended consequences. Are you concerned that this shift, as you said, a real paradigm shift from the Biden administration, might actually send a message to people in Mexico, more, more importantly in Central America, to come north and try to come across the border and actually may exacerbate the problem rather than fix it? Well, again, you know, we have... It's going to take – none of this is going to happen overnight. Uh, we've got thousands, tens of thousands of families sitting just on the other side of the border in Mexico who were placed there by this so-called wait in Mexico policy, that the MPP, Migrant Protection Protocol, which basically meant that people who applied for asylum got stuck in Mexico living in squalor and danger um, on the Mexican side. Uh, that, that policy is, is, is being lifted. Uh, but it's going to take months, year, perhaps more than that, to straighten out uh, those families on the Mexican side of the border and make sure that their situation is, is dealt with fairly and with due process. As far as families coming up, look, America is a beacon for the world. That's what we've, that's what we've always been. My, my, my parents, uh, I'm sure many other folks' parents, came here because of the promise of America. So we'll always have that draw. But I think what this administration is doing, if you read over um, the, the, the summary of the executive order that came out of the White House, is they're going to work on a couple of different things to prevent surges at the border. Number one, they're going to try to get to the root causes of what causes folks to come up here. That's the instability down in Central America, the violence, the economic insecurity. America has a stake in working with those countries to solve those problems. We're going to work with our regional partners down there. Um, governments, nonprofits, other other countries that that are involved, you know, in in, in the root causes of, of the problem, which leads people to come up here, and uh, find legal avenues in the U.S. Um, that yep. uh, that make sure that people who do come up here are dealt with fairly and with due process and have reasonable. Yep opportunities to have their asylum cases heard. David, as you know so well, and we all understand there are real humanitarian considerations to all this, there also are economic considerations, business considerations. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce actually has made immigration reform one of its priorities because it says American companies need some of the workers from, for example, the Dreamers. But going beyond that, immigration under H-1B, is the Biden administration going to address that issue as well as the humanitarian? Yes, and that is an issue that is near and dear to my heart as a business immigration attorney. I, I will tell you that uh, what, the, what the White House has said in its, in its fact sheet that came out uh, last night was that they are going to ask the Department of Homeland Security to do a top-to-bottom review of the myriad of rules and regulations and other regulations, guide, guidance memoranda, and other obstacles that, was, that were put in the way of legal immigration. Uh, by the Trump administration, including, including I would assume, the H-1B program, the L-1 intercompany transfer program. What most people don't realize, and certainly what the, the Trump administration either didn't want to understand, clearly didn't understand, right. was that 
business immigration, folks who are coming in here with high skills, folks who are coming in here to, to, to invest in our country, right. to do much needed research, as we all know, particularly in a time of a pandemic, create jobs in the United States, bring in investment, bring in money, um, lift up all of us, uh, right. American workers alike, uh, by the creation of jobs and right. investment in this country. So I think right. the Biden administration understands that. Right. And I think that's why they put a focus on, on taking a hard look at the legal immigration system right. to make sure that it works. David, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. That's David Leopold. He's partner at Ulmer and Byrne. Coming up, our stock of the hour is Uber as it doubles down on the stay-at-home trade. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We have some breaking news right now coming us to Bloomberg. President Trump is now responding to the article of impeachment that is pending over in the Senate. As we know, the memorandum, or really brief, was filed by the Democrats earlier today, laying out the case against President Trump. Now, President Trump is responding, and he's saying, among other things, that it is fundamentally flawed. It's flawed because the Senate no longer has jurisdiction over him as the former president of the United States, no current, not currently serving. That's the argument that was already presented to the Senate. As we know, it was uh, uh, narrowly defeated, but there are quite a few Republicans who said this is okay to go forward, which really raises questions about the ultimate conviction. At the same time, he also says what he's being accused of, what he's being essentially indicted for, is actually constitutionally protected speech, which is, we expect him to be presenting in his memorandum, in his brief, which is due next week. So this is the back and forth now happening over in the Senate as they're presenting their written pleadings one after the other. The Democrats coming first this morning, and now we have it from President Trump as well. Now, we expect that the trial will begin next week in the Senate, and it's supposed to t happen every day starting at noontime. It's supposed to take less time than the three weeks required for the first p impeachment trial of President Trump. The estimations are something like two weeks. Once again, most people do not expect, absent some real development we can't anticipate right now, most people do not expect a conviction, given that uh, the majority, uh, the, uh, that uh, only a very few Republicans went along with the proposal to stop it altogether. We'll have more on that as it develops. And coming up, we'll talk about the Biden administration's new fuel emission standards. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to recap now what happened just a short time ago. We now have the formal document in which President Donald Trump, through his lawyers, responds to that one article of impeachment claiming that he incited sedition against the United States. In, in some substance, what the president says is, number one, you don't have jurisdiction because I'm not president anymore. It doesn't apply to me. So the whole thing has to stop. Something that was argued, actually, and was voted on uh, with a, ma a majority, but a narrow majority agreeing that they could go forward, and that's really suggested a question about supermajority voting to convict. Also going on to say, whatever I said, whatever I said about what I thought about the election, whether it was appropriate or not, whatever I said to the mob or the crowd on the mall, that was protected speech constitutionally. And the Constitution protects even unpopular speech, basically saying what I said was not very popular, but it nevertheless is protected. So we now have a better sense of what President uh, Trump is going to present for his case. Although I must say, in a quick perusal of the document, he he goes pretty light on the, the election was stolen, which is rumored to be something he wanted to argue strongly. That, there's not a lot of that in this document at this point. That, so that's the pleadings. Then now we're going to have a trial, we expect, starting sometime next week in the Senate. Let's turn now from the Trump impeachment to President Biden and President Biden's actions on climate. He signed a series of climate executive orders last week, and he said in doing so that it was not only climate day, but it was jobs day as well, as his policies would create millions of new jobs. For, for the economics of what he is proposing, let's go now to Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, Michael McKee. So, Michael, what is he talking about with all these millions of jobs? 
Uh, basically, David, he is trying to make a virtue out of necessity. There are millions of people who are out of work, and many administrations come in in that situation and propose infrastructure plans, which is exactly what Joe Biden is doing, but he's casting it in terms of jobs and casting infrastructure in terms of green energy. Let's take a look at what would have happened had we not had the coronavirus recession. You can see the blue line, if we'd been growing at the 2019 pace all the way up until today, this is where we'd be in terms of GDP instead of down here. So this is the space that Biden wants to fill in. Now, you look at the jobs that he is uh, trying to, uh, to to support, and that is in the energy sector, the green energy sector. You know, Satchel Page once said, don't look back, something's gaining on you. <laughs> well, the stuff in this category, uh, the, the, the uh, re renewable energy jobs are gaining rapidly on the jobs that we used to have or that were the foundation of our energy society. You look at in the oil industry and you look at wind and solar and how many jobs, and uh, there's a million five hundred thousand jobs in the auto industry building traditional cars, but we're up to 500,000 for hybrids and electronic vehicles. So very quickly changing, and Biden wants to move on that. This is the sort of summary of his plan. Infrastructure, uh, build, rebuild bridges and roads and things, but also build the green energy of the future. Autos transition to uh, alternative fuels, eventually phase them out. That would be after he leaves office. Uh, then you would have uh, the federal government spend a lot more on transit. Cities over 100,000 would get money for transit. Buildings upgrade those, uh, upgrade 4 million of them to make them more energy efficient. And basically you end up with a carbon pollution free power sector by 2035. That's his goal. Whether he can reach it or not is another question. But if he can, it probably does mean a lot of jobs. The question is how many get lost in other industries and how does that balance out? Mike, that was a great recap. And any any hit that includes Satchel Page and it has got to be a winner. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Joining us now for more on this is Ellen Hughes Cromwick. She is senior resident fellow at Third Way's Climate and Energy Program. Earlier, Ms. Cromwick served as the chief economist at the Ford Motor Company and at the Department of Commerce. So, Ellen, thank you so much for being with us. Give us your take as an economist on President Biden's rather bold predictions about the creation of jobs from this climate approach. I appreciate Michael's setup. I think he's absolutely right. When you look at the jobs that are going to be created as a result of this plan, you can see how the capital markets are already moving there and the technology is advanced such that just taking autos in particular, the battery cost has come down so that now when a customer goes in to look at different products, they're going to see that an electric vehicle is going to be very price competitive. So starting from that core, what the Biden plan did was really build out and say, look, the technology has moved there. The capital markets are moving there. We're going to nudge it and get the flywheel going even faster. And, and it gives you a lot of optimism, really, that we can achieve this kind of reduction in carbon pollution as we look out over the next 10 to 20 years. It's really where everyone is going. And if we don't get there, my God, we're going to lose a lot of competitive force against China and Europe. So, so one thing I'm curious about, Ellen, is, are, are these jobs. It's one thing to create a job. It's another thing to have somebody who's in a position to fill it. I mean, it doesn't strike me that you can take a coal miner and just assign them to a, to a, a solar plant. Uh, are, are our people trained up enough so that we can move that they're not fungible, these people, right? Interesting that you point that out because Senator Manchin in particular has been talking exactly about this question. And really indicating in a third way link up that we did with him a few weeks ago, he said, listen, you know, these workers are really talented. And if we have the proper workforce development tools, they can do anyone. And, you know, living here in Michigan, I see that every single day. These workers have gotten great training and they can move to different places within the economy. They can you know, be building battery packs as well. I think that the workforce development tools, you know, if we can't get that right this time, there's something wrong. We've made a lot of advances in understanding how to retrain and get people moving in different parts of the economy. 
I'm more optimistic about that than, say, even 10 years ago. Ellen, you make a great point, because I, I come from Michigan as well. I know something about the auto industry, and whether it's Ford, your old company, or GM, they are retraining their workers right now, even as we speak, as they move over toward electric vehicles. How much as a society, as an entire economy in the United States, can we rely upon the private sector to do a lot of this training? I think the private sector is well positioned to do this. We've seen how successful some programs are, like apprenticeship training. That's really critical. I mean, my dad was in an apprenticeship training program when he was learning, you know, to become a teacher at some point. And I think those programs have shown success metrics. We need to just make sure that they're, you know, penetrating all these different sectors. And remember, right now we already have 3 million plus clean energy jobs. It's not like we're starting from scratch today. So there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of tech that we can use now that wasn't available. Like I said, even five to 10 years ago, I think we're in a perfect position to pivot and make this transition and ride the wave that's already underway in the capital markets. Give us a sense of other Biden administration initiatives that are either being taken or could be taken that could move us in this direction. And particularly, let's talk about auto emissions, because there's been a back and forth under the Trump administration between California and the federal government about standards. The automakers, as I understand it, now are trying to work with the Biden administration to have a similar sort of stand, set of standards. How much can we move forward simply through auto emissions regulation to try to encourage the move to electric vehicles? I think auto emissions are one of those factors that we put in a list of, hey, all of the above. It's not going to be the only tool that we can use, but certainly having a gradual, you know, 5% improvement in fuel economy over time is going to be helpful. But you know, the auto sector. In a matter of one product cycle, which is roughly three years, or two product cycles, which is, let's say, about six years, as they put new vehicles in these plants, you know, you really get to a point where you're going to have leapfrogging of fuel economy improvements if you convert the plant and retool it to make electric vehicles. And I think that's the thing we have to think about. Fuel economy gains are going to be okay here for maybe the next three to five years. But at that point, everybody's retooling. They're going to EVs. So the, the kind of regulation will become obsolete over time. I really believe that's the case. Ellen, thank you so very okay. much. That was really informative. That's Ellen Hughes Cromwick, Senior Resident Fellow at Third Way's Climate and Energy Program. She's going to be back with us in the second hour of Balance of Power to talk about the proposed stimulus plan. Now back to the breaking news concerning President Trump's response to the article impeachment. Let's bring in now Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton, who covers uh, Capitol Hill for us. So, Anna, now you have some time to go over this. Give us some sense of what the president is saying and how significant it is in this trial about to happen. Yeah, you really highlighted the two main points of his argument. First, that it's not constitutional to try a former president, even though Democrats said in their argument filed today that it is constitutional to try the president for something he did while he was still in office. The other main argument that we expect to hear from uh, former President Trump is that the, his speech on January 6th is protected by the First Amendment. Now, one sentence that really stood out for me when he said um, the phrase, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, the fact that that had anything to do with the action at the Capitol it was clearly about the need to fight for election security. So he's trying to say, you know, as I was saying, fight for your country, I actually meant election security, not physically fight lawmakers at the Capitol building. So, Anna, correct me if I'm wrong, because I just got a chance to glance through a brief while we're on the air. But I don't think in any place in this pleading he give, gives as a defense what I said was true, that in fact the election was stolen. I didn't see that in here, did I? No, and that's an excellent point. You know, he had some issues with his initial selection for his legal team because he had asked them to say that the election was fraudulent and that it was stolen. And so the attorneys that he initially picked for his defense team declined to do that, and they're no longer going to represent him. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that issue is treated during the Senate trial. But, yeah, the fact that the president 
maintains that this election was fraudulent, which, of course, is not true, is something that could uh, kind of inhibit his own defense. Okay, Anna, thank you so much for jumping on this. Really appreciate it. That's Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton, who covers the Capitol for us. Now, we have some breaking news right now. Alexei Navalny, that leading opponent to President Putin over in Russia, has now been sentenced to three and a half years in prison, minus time served. Remember, he originally been sentenced to three and a half years. That was suspended. While he was out on that suspension, he was poisoned, taken to Germany. And then when he came back to Russia, they put him in jail saying, you jumped your, your parole because you were in Germany getting over the poison rather than prison. So now he's been sentenced to three and a half years minus time served. We'll continue to follow that story as it develops. Meanwhile, coming up here, President Biden's opportunity to take the lead in global diplomacy from the former British Foreign Secretary, now head of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. When President Biden took the oath of office, he set a different tone and a different course from his predecessor, much of it dealing with domestic policy. But some of what he said and has done so far on foreign policy also looks and sounds different as well. We welcome now an authority on foreign policy. He is David Miliband. He served as the Foreign Secretary for the United Kingdom under Prime Minister Gordon Brown, and he now is the President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. David, thank you so much for being back with us. Really appreciate it. You have written already on the opportunity, as you see it, for the Biden administration to really reset not only the direction for U.S. foreign policy, but our role in the international community. Give us a sense of what the opportunity is there. David, thank you very much for having me on. Look, everyone understands that there are overriding priorities at home for the Biden administration, notably in respect of COVID, its economic impact, issues of racial justice, etc. However, my argument is that America won't solve its problems internally unless it also engages externally, it doesn't just engage in a different way, but acts in a different way as well. Uh, that's true in respect of the COVID crisis, where the cliche that none of us are safe until all of us are safe turns out to be true, uh, because the mutation of the virus, the variations of the virus, demand international action, not just national action. But there is a bigger picture, and what I've tried to sketch out uh, is a, a story that says that over the last 15 years, we've seen what I call the rise of an age of impunity, uh, an age where the norms and laws of international relations are being broken, where school children in a bus in Yemen are bombed, where Ukraine is invaded by the Russians. And this global age of impunity is a trend that is dangerous. It's costing the lives of civilians and aid workers, uh, who work for the International Rescue Committee around the world. Uh, but it's also setting the world on what I believe is an unsustainable basis. And so the stakes are very high for the Biden administration. It's not just reinserting America into the global system, for example, by rejoining the World Health Organization or rejoining the Paris Climate Pact. Uh, the world hasn't stood still uh, over the last 15 years, notably over the last four years, when America has practiced what Richard Haas, another guest on your program, has at various points called the withdrawal doctrine. Uh, America has uh, spent the last four years withdrawing from international engagement, and that's cost America. So there's a double challenge for the Biden administration uh, beyond the home front. The first challenge is to engage globally on issues that really matter, like uh, the COVID crisis, like climate change, but also to make sure that it is building um, a, a system of alliances that can provide a counter to this age of impunity that I think is so dangerous. Does the United States, in your opinion, have the capital to get that done? I mean, President Biden came to office saying he wanted to have a big international conference on democracy and the values of de uh, democratic values. And there are some reports now that some people around the, the world are saying, wait a second, we look at your democracy. It's not in that great shape. Come back to us after you got some things fixed. Does he have the capital to really lead in that area? Well, people are certainly asking fundamental questions about American democracy, not just at home, but abroad. But America does have the capacity to agenda set. Uh, America is burdened, is blessed by its size, its power, its scope, um, but it also has the burden of being an agenda setter. You can see all the countries around the world, small or large, are situating themselves for what the Biden administration might do. And so the question about the summit of democracies that you mentioned is not 
uh, what's the date? The question is, what's the agenda? Because people around the world feel, leaders around the world uh, feel, businesses around the world feel that this is a critical moment. The world's had what should be a wake-up call from the COVID crisis, but it can't afford the kind of a descent into animosity that happened in the 1920s and 1930s after the last global pandemic. Uh, leaders around the world want this to be a 1945 moment, not a 1918 moment. David, when I was in London some years ago, I loved, uh, learned a wonderful phrase about condescending to particulars. Uh, let's, <laughs> con to partic let's condescend to a particular right now, and let's make it COVID that you referred to, and vaccine, what has been called sort of the politicization of vaccine. Tell us about the U.S. role with respect to vaccine distribution, not just in this country. Goodness knows we're concerned about getting to American citizens, but around the world and the possible opportunities or risks here as some countries might get left behind. Look, here's the situation. Uh, for rich countries like the United States, you can see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there is a mess being made of uh, vaccine uh, distribution here in various states, but you can see how the population could get vaccinated. But globally, there's no such uh, clarity. Uh, the places that the International Rescue Committee works, we're looking two, three, four years before a vaccine, and goodness knows what will have happened with the variations by then. That's why there's a global imperative now of two kinds. First of all, to finance the purchase of vaccines that can go global. And secondly, to distribute them because it has to reach all corners of the world. And the US, alongside the UK and other industrialized countries, has an important role to play because not many people realize that the US has ordered 235 million more vaccines than it needs. Now, that made sense when the contracts were set last year because the government of the time wanted to make sure that there were adequate supplies and it didn't know which vaccines would come off. It turns out quite a few of them are coming off. And that's how the US has ended up in a situation where it's going to end up with excess vaccines. The UK, population 65 million, has got 400 million vaccines under order. So it's got six times as many uh, vaccines under order as its population. Uh, our point is that if there is to be a return to normality, it has to be a return to some kind of global openness. Uh, we can't have a normally functioning the U.S. if south of the border in Mexico or in Brazil, uh, there is no COVID proofing. And so that's why there needs to be a more systematic global effort. You referred to GOVAX. That's the global facility for global vaccination that the Biden administration has rejoined. And our point is there needs to be now a global plan for figuring out how beyond this year we can accelerate the uh, vaccination campaign that's going to be needed globally, not just locally. Okay, thank you so very much to David Miliband. He's the head of the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. We're going to have more with him coming up on the next hour of Balance of Power. We're going to talk with him about immigration and refugees in particular. Coming up here next, we're going to have a check of the markets. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're going to end the hour with another check on the markets, and Abigail Doolittle is here for that check. Last time we saw it, it looked like it was risk on. It doesn't look like it's come off very much. It is certainly still risk on, David. We have the best two-day rally for the S&P 500 going back to November. That was the case about an hour ago. It is still the case. But markets have been so volatile recently, you really wouldn't know if that would uh, hold through. It is lots of different factors at play. The top stock for the S&P 500, if you can believe it, Tesla. So that momentum mania for the big companies is back. We also have Amazon and Alphabet sharply higher. Those companies, of course, are reporting after the bell. And I think the expectation is that Amazon is going to put up double digit growth on both the top and the bottom line. The e-commerce giant, a beneficiary, of course, of the pandemic. Folks will probably be wondering how much of that will carry through. And then on the other hand, David, unfortunately, we do have some pain at hand. And that, of course, is with those mania stocks. 
What comes up, what goes up must come down. GameStop in the month of January up 1100% today, down 47%. The pain is likely to continue, uh, David. So much money being made and lost, this casino-like trading. Folks who uh, got in a little bit late probably chasing in a painful way. But one reason to think that these stocks will go back down. Uh, AMC at the beginning of the year, a $2 stock. Last week, a $24 stock, now an $8 stock. If we take a look at GameStop, it had also been a single digit stock at the end of last year uh, last week at one point a nearly five hundred dollar stock now a little bit above a hundred but those moving averages David suggest that we could see uh, GameStop go back to its 200 day moving average that's all the way at sixteen dollars so probably more volatility ahead at the same time I go take us all the way back to yesterday morning we we're all concerned about silver it looks like silver's come off as well it has and silver it's interesting because it has the precedent of 2011 silver in the beginning of 2011 was around ten dollars per troy ounce and then at some point I think in March April somewhere in that time $50 it's all time nominal high so you had that craze so I think that you had this uh, retail crowd remembering that silver uh, was uh, you know very uh, volatile at that time period the message board mania went right into silver SLV yeah. of course uh, poor man's gold and uh, <laughs> what again what goes up must come down reversing but uh, still not in the, as painfully. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets coming up. We're going to talk to somebody who's actually been the subject of a short squeeze. That's the head of Exos. This is Bloomberg.